darkness surrounds and it feels like there just may be no other way. There's always going to be a hope revealed. Hello, I am Tracy Phillips. I am an executive and performance coach and I help business owners and corporate professionals to analyze critically, articulate with strategy and lead with confidence so they can come out to be the best leaders that they came here to be. Uh, and be the servant leaders um, that, that they're really created to be. Um, you can reach me at my website, www.theinnatecoach.com, uh, or I'm on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. I love to have people reach out uh, with feedback, questions. Um, so hopefully I'll, I'll hear from you. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Hope Revealed. So happy to have you with us today because we have an incredible person with us by the name of Miss Tracy Phillips that you met just a moment ago. And uh, I'm super excited to have her with me because she lives right down the road. She's like 45 minutes down the road. I live in a little tiny little town called Fayetteville, North Carolina, home of Fort Bragg, largest military base in the world. And she lives in this giant, giant town, <laughs> this metropolis of a place. It has like, like two story houses. But on a serious two-story houses in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Tracy. <laughs> Thanks so much, Matt. It's such a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's been great uh, getting to know you, and we're having a good time uh, this morning. And uh, yeah, she lives in a little town, but it's a, it's one of those ni nice little North Carolina towns that um, when you think about North Carolina, you think in your mind, what would it look like? And what's all, that's what Pittsburgh is, that kind of a little town. It's like, this For is North sure. Carolina. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. And it's about to change, folks. So if you get a chance to come visit us in the next couple of years, you're probably going to want to do so because it's about to blow up. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. This, uh, the town I'm in is, is really stretching its arms and uh, it's, it's moving out into a lot of different places because folks like to move out you know, where it's more rural and then eventually it's not that rural anymore. It's not rural. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, Tracy, you have been doing a lot of things over, over your lifespan and um, you have an opportunity now to do things as in the coaching world, in the professional world with corporate uh, offices, corporate businesses, CEOs, CEOs of that nature. So tell me a little bit more about it, uh, what it is that you really do on, on a day-to-day -day basis with folks. Day-to-day -day basis, so it seems to be more, and like you said, more and more these days, but what I really focus on, I mean, in the core of, I feel, the mission of my life is to help facilitate people coming back home to themselves. So people say, you know, what does that mean, coming home to oneself? You know, it's that authentic place. I mean, the, the word authenticity, I think, is thrown around quite a lot these days, but, you know, for yeah. me, it's that what we, what, we were, what we were created, you know, by God to be. Um, and, and oftentimes, you know, we, we don't think in those terms, you know, we think, you know, what am I here to do? Uh, what did I go to school to do? What do what my parents want me to do? What does my community want me to do? Right? So we're, although we're not human doers or human beings, we don't really think about this concept of who am I here to be? Yeah. And so really helping people, you know, obviously I work in the leadership, uh, realm and it's incredibly important because if you think people are leading others from this place of not knowing who they are. I mean, and we look at where we are in today's world too, and it's no yeah, surprise yeah. because it's kind of this concept of what do we all feel we need to be doing and, and being from a place of, of, you know, the expectations of others. So it's really an identity yeah. issue. So you're doing a lot of yeah. identity coaching, I guess, in that sense. Ad right? You know, the identity, and that's what my LinkedIn profile says is it's it's really about unique identity you know who am i and and more specifically you know digging into those places where we do know i mean we came into this world as little babies knowing exactly what we were here for the only problem is we couldn't speak right so we couldn't <laughs> communicate that and by the time we could we've been so indentured and culturated in in the community mind think that we lost it Right? We had these masks that we call identity uh, that piled up on top of our true identity. And so peeling you know, those false you know, selves off uh, can be quite, can be quite a, a daunting task sometimes, especially when you don't even know that that's what's going on. Right? Yeah. Um, so how, how can, that's, I'm just thinking here out, out loud since we're on a podcast. Um, <laughs> you know, so identity, that's a big deal. And let's say you're talking to a 50 something year old CEO of a business, been doing it for quite a long time. So I, I'm assuming you're not going in there and then in, in two or three easy sessions, you've worked through his identity issues and you're moving forward, right? 
Not at all. Well, and you know, and I have a unique skill that you and I have talked about. You know, I, I came, one of the things that I was God gifted with um, for the reasons that I was made, you know, to do what I do uh, is the ability to listen to people's language and pick out the areas of genius right within them, but also the areas that are holding them back, you know, so those belief systems or those ways we've identified our, our selves, you know, in ways that are not authentic. Um, and, and that keeps us, you know, tethered to a false sense of identity as opposed to what we're really here for. And we wonder why we can't move ahead or it's mm. so hard uh, to move. And so I listen to people. That's, I mean, I do that all day long. And, you know, as a person who's listening for the patterns um, within the language, yeah, you know, all I'm doing is kind of mirroring back. This is what I hear you saying. Uh, it doesn't line up, right? Over here, you said this. It's incongruent with this. Let's look at there's a reason why it's incongruent. Let's figure that out. Let's unpack that. So yeah, it takes time. Um, and you know, and also to a lot of people say, well, how do you get these leaders to want to dig in, especially the male leaders you work with? You know, they, you know, typically men, you know, kind of hold those, they're right. going to get a poker, you know, mm. right? <laughs> Manny, <laughs> they get a poker because man. they can hold it tight <laughs> to their chest. Um, you know, and I'm like, well, it's, it's like anybody else, whether you're male or female, you have to be ready for this. You know, I'm not waltzing into people's offices and demanding that they open up to their authentic selves. I think I'd probably be arrested by now. Tracy's here. Man up. <laughs> you must come home to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> not exactly how it works. Um, so it's the people who have, have hit those blocks, you know, and, and realized, God, you know, either the way I've been doing things aren't, isn't working anymore. Or, you know, and or the world has shifted. I mean, I hear from a lot of the older generation leaders about millennials, right? The younger <laughs> generation. You and I talked about this, right? That, I mean, what I try to tell them is it is what it is. We have to work with what is. We could sit there and admonish, you know, how things are like, oh, God, you know, we've gone down this, this terrible uh, rabbit hole of not raising our kids to have to work for the, you know, what they earn and that type of thing. Well, you know. Today's world is what it is. How do we work with what is? And I think that's the biggest thing, whether you, know, whether you are an older leader, a brand new leader, wherever you are in your developmental process, what is hard for humans is to work with what is. I mean, you know better than anyone. You know, it's, it's like, okay, this is the reality. How do we find the solutions within the reality? Not what would we wish for instead? You know, how can we turn back the clocks you know, because we're not doing that. We're, it's right. not possible, nor would we want to because yeah. progress is moving forward. So, so it's really creating a mindset that's congruent with the goal set, right? So if people have goals, they want to, you know, create a certain legacy. They want to create, you know, a certain amount of money or, or whatever value they're trying to create in the world. Is their mindset aligned with the direction they want to take things? And, and half the time when I unpack it with people, it's not. Wow. Right? So, all right. So then let's pause there for a second and camp out. So is, can you think of, all right, let's say Bob, you know, he's had his business for 27 years and um, he's got, you know, 13 employees and, and uh, they all call work home. You know, they live there. It's all nice environment, but, but Bob's got a few of those issues in his life. Right. So, so what would be something that you would have heard from Bob that doesn't align and how could you how could you help pull that into alignment what would be i mean in a in a fake example i mean think of something that you've had in your past and kind of put it together into a person and and let's kind of hear what that sounds like a little bit yeah so you know i, I think that's that that is kind of the stip the stereotypical business owner what you you know what you've just described and a lot of times what i see is it is a changing workforce for you know, first of all, I mean, Bob could perhaps, let's just say he's, he, he is experiencing that because we could say he's had the same people for the last, you know, 20 years and they, you know, it's, it's family and, and all that. I mean, that's a whole different dynamic of issue usually because it's, it is like working with family <laughs> right, right. Um, and that, and that has its own, you know, challenges, but let's just say Bob is working with a constantly changing workforce. And what that means is that, you know, he, the way in which he leads his people, first of all, they're different people, you know, and maybe, maybe he sees turnover every couple of years in certain key positions. Um, and so it's not only working with a whole different individual, you know, the, the workforce is getting younger and younger. 
you know, not because they're getting younger, but Bob's getting older and older. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and, you know, how we've done things, I hear this from a lot of owners, but, but that's how I've done it. I'm like, well, that's fine. But clearly how you've done it isn't working for what is right now. And that's what we, you know, we, we could sit here and have a conversation all day long about what worked and how we can try to force fit what worked then into the situation now, but it's going to take willpower. Mm -hmm. And what I try to explain to people is willpower is a limited resource. You know, it's like with diets, we can only stay on a diet so long because we're utilizing willpower to stay on it. You know, until it becomes a lifestyle, it's gonna take willpower. And willpower right. on average, I mean, people like you probably, it's extended longer, but the typical person is You about can run out of energy. It takes and three you, months. You have you know, to, three you months. Have to re you have to recharge the batteries. It doesn't mean that you lose forever, but you have to recharge been that process is not a pleasant process. Well, it's not sustainable. No. You know, and when I'm working with clients, it's not about status quo. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm here like what is best case scenario, not as just what's okay and what's good enough. Okay. You know, but if, but if we're looking to create a system, I want it to be sustainable. So we're only looking at the sustainable options. Right. You know, so working with what is, it's to say, what is your, what I try to get Bob to understand as a business owner is what is the outcome you're shooting for? Let's first create that vision of what you want it to look like. And then we'll work backwards, right? And we'll break it down into individual, you know, personalities, individual relationships that you have with each of your employees. Um, because that, you know, and that's on the smaller scale On the larger scale, we have, of course, different dynamics, but in general, a lot of people think that, you know, it is good to be present. They're like, well, I just need to put out the fires that are in front of me. It's like, I get that. But the reason you're probably putting out fire after fire, after fire, year after year, after year is that you never did set that vision in place. It would be like me saying, okay, I want to head to Durham and not have an actual address. You know, but 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 have an idea of where I want to get, and just hope that I'm going to like stumble upon it. it it's going to take me much longer, if at all. You know, even if I get there. Right, um, right. But if I have an actual address that I can that I can put into my GPS, you know, the likelihood of me getting there is very high. Um. So that's that's the one thing is that we you know we we create that, and it's not just goals. You know, everybody focuses on goals. What are your goals? You know, I believe there's two things we get to look at, but goals come second to the first, which is intentions, right? The difference for me between intention and goal is int intention is who do I want to be? Goals are what I want to do, you know, and our society is very much like goal driven. So it's like, this is what I have to do. And then we, that's why we become so confused about who we are because we shift who we are to, to incorporate what we want to do. Instead of saying I fit that into that box, you're like, well, wait a minute, that's not really who I am or what I'm, really, you know, what I'm called to do. Yeah, I mean, when I talked, to, I worked. I, I told you I worked for three years as a volunteer at Butner Federal Prison in a men's transformational program, and most of the guys in there were ex executives. And so I'm like, how'd you get here? You know, and it was that very thing. It's like, well, I had to do this, but then I had to kind of, you know, maybe walk outside of my box of integrity to get it done. I had to kind of be somebody I wouldn't have chosen to be otherwise. I'm like, well, how did that work out for you? You know, um, <laughs> jail prisoner number one, five, seven, four. Yeah. Exactly. You know, not, not, you know, not to try to, you know, be rude about the situation, but you know, again, it is what it is. And right. you know, when we really have to take ownership of the fact that where we are right now, we created it, right? We, we put ourselves right where we are at this moment. And that is not to be judged. It's to be looked at as what is. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if this isn't making me happy, if there's some aspect of what I've created that is not working for me, I get to unpack that and figure out what it is that I'm doing to create that, right? Who am I being or allowing myself, you know, to be? In other words, I may be stepping out of who I really would be comfortable being if I was really looking at it carefully. And maybe that's a big part of it, you know? Um, I see that with, with a lot of people who are unhappy in whatever situation. It's they're like, you know, I am trying to be this for other people. If I was left to my own devices, I don't think I would be being this, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, I'm only doing it for others. I'm not doing it for myself. Well, that's a big deal. I mean, I'm guilty as charged for that in many areas of my life from my past and, and somewhat you know, today. But uh, you can't always do everything for everybody when you've done nothing for yourself. And I, I think one of the temptations or the thoughts that I would have had in that statement would be that I would have felt selfish or I would have felt self-seeking by putting me first. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's really nothing wrong with putting yourself first if you have 
the right outlook and the right frame. I can put myself first and, and, and possibly serve more people than if I don't and I'm trying to reach everybody. There's a big difference. You know what I found time and time again in my work is that, you know, we've been so conditioned to worry about being egoic, right? And stepping away from that very thing, stepping away from, I mean, we all understand the analogy of when we get on a plane and they tell us, you know, if the, if the pressure changes in, in, you know, the cabin, the oxygen mask comes down, what do you do first? You put it on yourself. We all get that concept because not only if, you know, if you don't put it on yourself, not only can you not help others, you become a liability to others, right? Like they have to help you right? You can't help them and they have to stop what they're doing to help you. So as, as to be an asset and not a liability, we have to put that oxygen mask on first. And what I found in my, in my work, in my studies and everything is that I do believe naturally, unless there's just some total anomaly that's happening in, in the human system, we all want, we all are actually servant based at heart. You know, like they, when I studied a lot of things, um, I was doing a lot of work and interested in narcissism because I met a lot of people early, especially in, when I was in the federal prison system, you know, people who would be diagnosed typically as narcissistic. And I was really curious as to what bred that. And what happened was they didn't get certain needs met early, early on. And so it's like, you know, when we couldn't meet our own needs, if we learned through patterning that those needs were not only not going to be met by anybody, that if they were going to be met, we had to meet them ourselves. Then we created the system of then only focusing on that so we could survive. I mean, that's what these people essentially have done. Um, and so, but if there, if, if it had been natural progression, if they had been supported lovingly up to the point where developmentally, they then could put on their own oxygen mask and serve from that place of being served then none of that would have happened. So to me, it's that something that, that glitch in the system, it's not that these people are, are evil or bad or, or, you know, want to be, you know, totally focused on self. It's that they're stuck in a pattern that happened a long time ago. And if that pattern gets corrected, then they also have the availability to turn out and serve others, right? Over, over a period of time of therapy and, and, and learning different patterns, you know, so really our nature is to want to do that. You know, it's our head that gets in this concept of ego. And when we do serve ourselves and we have more groundedness, you know, and, and more to give, right? We, we fill our own tank so yeah. that we have more to give others. Then that's what we do. I mean, I see it time and again. And it's not from a place of headiness of look at how much I have to give. It's always from this amazing place of humility. I mean, I've experienced that in my own life. You know, when I ground myself and really make sure you know, I'm tapped in and I've put my own oxygen mask on. The amount of gratitude I have for what I have to give is it, it almost, it brings me to tears. Like that humility of what God has gifted me with in order to do what I do, you know, it, 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 it never becomes a head game because it's coming from a self-sustained place, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, and I don't just mean from those things here. It's like, you know, I think when we look in, we look up. I go in to go up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, and, and so when we, we work on doing that, then it, it absolutely predisposes ourselves to look beyond for that ultimate support, right? So it's like I'm supporting myself through making sure I'm open to, you know, the ultimate support. And so, it, but, but when we have that feeder system, there's a never end. There is no end to the amount of what we have to give. You know, this idea of limited giving you know, only when we're cut off from our source, you know, only it's when a lack, we're it's a lack mentality versus abundance mentality. And yeah. uh, for me, it's one of the things that I talk about in my branding, of course, is that, that uh, I believe we're called to, to live an abundant life. And, and, you know, I've had to actually do a whole series on abundance because I think abundance is a misunderstood word in many cases. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and abundance is not, you know, the smallest part of abundance is money. <laughs> so it's just amazing how that, how that works. But it's so important to understand what those things are. So when you say, look, up, look in, look up, all that kind of things that you're saying, uh, specifically because you're a follower of Christ and, and uh, you're, you're grounded in, in your faith with God. But I love the way you're able to say, I don't mean, but like that's a bad term to say in between God segueing back. In. And yeah, <laughs> that was bad. That was bad. Sorry, God. Um, I would say um, to have that, and the way you're able to reach people in the business world, 
which is kind of what I'm doing here on LinkedIn as well. I mean, I'm not out there, you know, standing on a soapbox with a Bible and have, you know, start just reading out scriptures and telling people they're going to go to hell. Um, what I do is I try to take the concepts that I've learned and the things that he's shown me and be able to share them with other people. And of course, sometimes people ask questions of like, well, tell me more about that. And we do, we talk about that, but you're able to incorporate the, who you are, you know, that's back to identity, um, who you are into what you're doing with other people. And um, it seems to be that, well, I mean, you're still working, so it must be doing pretty good. Yeah, and I find that, again, when we serve, and, and people are really shocked by this statement, but I stand by it each and every time, when we serve ourselves, all else is served. And I don't mean from a place of ego. I mean from a place of putting on the oxygen mask, tapping in and realizing that, you know, we really have to surrender, that this is, isn't about us, right? It's not about yeah, right the one there. me. That right there was worth the price of admission. There you go. Tracy said something powerful right there. You've been saying some power all the time. That was, a, that was definitely, that was tweetable. That's Thank true. you. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, the, good. it's the core of what we believe. Right. And, and so when yeah. we can state it, when we can comfortably say, look, aside from, I know we're supposed to be, you know, non-religious, non-political, not, you know, the political correct concepts. I think that has really steered us so far away from being who we are. And when it's really not about that, it's about how we do it. It's not about what, right. You know, it's like for so many years of, I think our, you know, main adult years was the political correct movements and how you're supposed to water down, you know, don't say anything too directly because you may be talking to someone who comes from a different political background or religious background. You don't want to offend. You don't want to offend. And so, so many people got afraid to be who they were. They were afraid to offend. You know, we were again, so conditioned to worry so much about what others thought and less about who we were, who we are, that we, we put these masks on. Right. And so now it's, I always say, it's not about, who you are, it's about how you choose to approach being that person, right? So own who you are, right? Be that, don't be afraid to speak it, but just recognize how you do that is going to affect others, right? So to your point of, of knowing your audience or knowing, you know, being, being um, what's the word, reverent, mm. being reverent to the fact that you, the world at large is a, is a, you know, made up of many different types of people who meet, believe in many different types of things. All right, so what's the difference between reverence and fear? Because here's an example. Ooh, Ooh right. that's a no. great question. Hold on, because that's a good one. Right, here's the example. I was watching a show last night, and uh, in the show, a gal had come to apply for a position at work. And uh, it was a position, of, uh, it was like a, a warehouse, and they had uh, gardening things, and bags of dirt and whatnot and everything so she was a skinny little you know little thing i mean she's a small small gal right so she's sitting at the desk the guy liked her and he said um i um i don't want to offend you i don't mean any disrespect and i don't want this to seem sexist but i don't know how else i i just have to ask you this question can you lift that bag over there and she so up and she walked over and picked up the bag. It was like a 50 pound bag of dirt or something like right? that. She goes, yeah. And he goes, okay, thank you. Where, she goes, where do you want me to put it? He says, nowhere, you can put it right back down. <laughs> he came, sat back down. And I thought, how stupid is this that we've come to a place in society and work that when somebody's coming to apply for a job, who cares who it is, man, woman, black, white, doesn't matter, that one of the things you have to do is be able to lift something over 50 pounds, right? A lot of times that when I was a kid, Growing up, I, they used to have that on an application. Can you lift over 50 pounds? Check wow. yes, check no, right? But he just was, he wanted to ask the woman if she could lift something. But instead, he was scared that he was going to offend her because it was a sexual, sexist statement, right? So back to my point. That's an example. What's the difference between reverence and fear? Reverence to me comes from a place of deep respect you know, in approaching, you know, approaching the question of, you know, I think that he could have probably asked that question. I, I didn't see him ask the question, but just based on your interpretation of it, it was coming from fear. Like, I, I don't want to offend you. I don't, you know, the language basically shows that. Um, whereas is that, you know, in, it, to just say what it is, I always believed clarity is kindness, right? When you're, when you're straight across and clear, it is kind. 
right? So in this job, it's very important that people are able to pick up something over 50 pounds. Is that something you're capable of? I don't want to assume that you're not, but I have to ask the question. Without the, I don't want to, uh, you know, yeah. it's that's the difference is that there's reverence for the job that needs to get done but there's also reverence for the person. It's like i don't want to assume that you can't but i gotta ask this question you know because it's a part of the job i think we just have gotten so squeamish and and especially i mean and i'm not saying that it's not legitimate because of what we've built up you know in our culture of expectation you know with men these days you know running scares like every time we turn on the news some man is going to prison for you know some alleged it's almost Thanks. like you just go to work as a man these days and you don't say anything. You don't, you don't talk to anybody. You should have no relationships whatsoever. And I mean, and, that's, probably, and, that's probably sexist too. Who knows? You know what I'm saying? I don't know. And honestly, I think that's the worst thing because if we already look, I mean, just in my work with men, the, the, that has gotten us where we are already. So to go further to that extent, to shut those men down even more when we, you know, it's gone much so far the them, other way that it's, it's just shut. It's, it's mm -hmm. just as bad as what it was the other the other side. Not the right. different spectrum of of bad. It's just we missed it in the middle somewhere where we were supposed to stop. <laughs> it just didn't. <laughs> well, and I always tell people if you shut it down, it's not like you shut it away. It just goes underground. Mm -hmm. And and when things go underground, I'll tell you what, it's not getting better. You know, so mm -hmm. it it's one of those things that we need to bring it up. We need to not be so squeamish about it. We need to be able to, I mean, call a spade a spade. I mean, by all means, if somebody is sexually harassing you or, or saying something inappropriate, call them on it. And if nothing happens, leave the environment, right? Like we have free will. At the end of the day, we like, but I need the job. You don't need it that much, right? You can't sit there one. and call foul on one side and stay in the room on the other. That's sorry. Mm -hmm. That's your responsibility. Contrary to beliefs, there's, uh, there's many available jobs in the United States of America. Well, here for us in America, there's plenty of jobs available. Just got to find one. Pick one. No job is worth you being degraded. Sorry. You know, and I'm going to say that to male, female, you know, dog, cat, child. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You know, there is nothing worth, worth you going through degradation. There just isn't of any kind. And I think that's big, the biggest problem is we don't love ourselves first. We're going to put up with not only in others, but we're also probably going to dish out the types of irreverent behavior that we are not even aware we're doing, right? Well, because we've got so would, accustomed would to not working. That, I would say that the definition of irreverent behavior has changed. I think that today, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Here we go. <laughs> believe, we're going there. <laughs> I can't believe that the young people today, um, some of the things they consider to be over the line, that, that, weren't and not because we were stupid and domineering no i mean come on really like i i grew up holding the door open for for a woman right well specifically my woman my wife you know but i mean i, I do it for my daughter um i do it for anybody see somebody come up behind me even as the guy it doesn't matter i don't care if it's a guy or gal but i like to hold some people i i remember one time in my life i was holding the door open for somebody else won't say which sex it was and that person was uh, offended that I opened the door for them. Mm. Oh, wow, <laughs> really? I mean, so uh, that kind of stuff. I'm not talking about, you know, some guy wanting to touch your body or saying he wants to take you out and go do whatever with you. That's obviously crossed the line. I'm talking about innocent stuff that got turned into now it's bad stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot of that that goes on both sides of the spectrum. Um, male and female. It's like women can do things towards, can, can do that, project stuff towards men, and men projecting stuff towards women happens both sides of the spectrum. Um, I know for sure. Uh, and well, you just of, said it. You just said the word. It's we're projecting, projecting. right? So okay. we're working out our own issues, whatever those are, and everybody's always working out issues. I mean, we have collective issues, and then we have individual issues, and those are always a microcosm to the macrocosm. So usually they're one and the same yeah. to some degree. But you know, as we're going through these shifts and changes, and like, who are we? Because we're working out our own collective identity. You know, who are we collectively? Um, you know, as 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 a world population, as a you know, a nation population, as a family dynamic population. You know, who are we? And so, you know, this idea of identity is always an important one and constantly re-evolving. I mean, constantly. It never. It, people's like, oh, well, when am I going to get there and get like? There is no there. Like. <laughs> 
<laughs> there's there's no getting there and then like what are, what are you gonna do like rock your way into death like I mean it's it's you know it's there is no there it's it's constant so the more flexible we can get and realizing that what is is always gonna look different you know what is right now as we're talking is gonna be different five minutes from now right and so if we get out of this idea, this concept of it has to look a certain way, like I think that's the thing too, is people are so afraid to be who they are because it needed to look a certain way. And now we're breaking that can of worms open. And so now, like my daughter is incredibly offended in her generation, so she's almost 13. You even say anything that smacks to the slightest degree of trying to uh, put someone into a category, she has a fit. She does not like boxes. Her, her generation is like, you. it doesn't matter if that person doesn't know what their, you know, affiliation is with gender, with, you know, with political, with it. You, you can't put them in a box. You can't label them. That's not right. You just can't label them. And so now we're being forced by the younger generations and where we've spent centuries understanding how to work with things by labeling them. Right. And so we're like, oh, how do we know what to do with it until we define what it is and put it in this box and say, OK, you're going to go over here. We're going to I mean, how do we organize? How do we how yeah. do we do that? And these generations are like totally throwing a wrench in that. And I'm not saying either way is right or wrong. There is no right or wrong. It simply is what it is. And we get to say, OK, that is coming in for a reason. We have collect you know, we we collectively from up high, you know, are going through lessons and are going through this growth that if we try to keep putting the, you know, the, the label of what was on it, that's what hurts. That's what keeps us stuck. You know, this idea of somebody projecting on you that you holding the door was somehow keeping them, you know, it's almost like the slavery thing. It's like, yeah. I can hold the door myself. It's like, well, I didn't say you couldn't. <laughs> This is, this is a gift. I mean, because I'm giving you flowers doesn't mean I'm saying you can't get your own. Right. You know, I just want to give you this gift of flowers. And it's how you're choosing to take it. You know, it's the story you're giving it. And that's fine. I just want you to know that's not, that wasn't the story I was delivering it through. And so the communication is important because things were constantly changing. So I always say it's not about the right answer and how we're going to, you know, the one way to handle this. It's that how are we going to learn to communicate with one another from a place of neutrality so that we're not constantly acting or reacting to our triggers? We're not reacting. We're not being reactionary. We're actually being good listeners, regardless of whether we like what we're hearing, agree with what we're hearing, you know, and, and even go along with what we're hearing, right? We can accept what is without, you know, going along with it. You know, and I think that that's, I mean, when I tell people, you know, we have these situations with like, okay, I want you to come together and we're going to just hear each other out. Your job is simply to understand where the other person's coming from. You don't have to like it. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to get along with it. You just need to try to work to understand, right? Put yourself in their shoes. If in, even if it's just temporarily, that's all. That's the only job you have. Both sides, Right is to be reverent and respectful of each other as human beings and to try to understand where the other person's coming from. That's it. And I think if we can learn to do that, all of our relationships, whether it's in jobs, whether it's in marriages, whether it's in families, you know, whether it's just the person, you know, sitting across from me at the coffee shop, you know, who is doing something that is triggering me in some way, you know, if I cannot give my story to their life, if I can say, okay, this is the story I'm reading this through, but if I were to look at it holistically from a point of view of neutrality and not knowing, what could I pick up from that situation? Could I maybe understand that that person is acting in this particular way because something just happened? You know, what if I trusted? I know Brene Brown's husband said, I choose to believe that everybody's doing their best. And when Brene was like, well, how do you know that? Because I don't know that, but it makes me feel better thinking it. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, and that comes right back to a little projection you were talking about uh, a moment ago. Uh, so powerful. I think about one of the first things you said when we started the show about uh, a baby who uh, comes to the world and they've got it, everything's good to go. And then all of a sudden we start having to take on these, all these things. I mean, baby has a couple of responsibilities. Well, three, eat, poop, pee, repeat. 
<laughs> I mean, you know, what do babies do for us? Really nothing. We do everything for them, right? It doesn't come until a little bit later on that that, that baby has to start growing up. And then what is that baby growing up uh, into? You know, and that's a lot of times, mostly, uh, you know, the large percent of it is what is our surrounding, you know? Yeah. So, uh, well, our, our system of doing, right? Like you, you and I, we came from a generation where when we came out of the womb it, and, and as we were developing, we were taught, you're not valuable until you do something valuable. Right. So, you know, you could dangle the carrots in front of us and we're like, you know, like the Pavlovian dogs, you know, and trying to chase that thing because that, that that's where we can have value. If I do that, if I can reach that, that carrot, then I have, cre I've done something to prove that I've done something valuable. Therefore I'm valuable, right? That's how we've identified ourselves through our doings. These kids, these days, they know they're valuable, but the thing is, is they're bumping, buck, bumping up, bumping up against these systems that are that are built on this concept of doing to be and they're coming and going like a baby like all the baby what you just described you know eating pooping peeing and sleeping right that would be the other thing i would say they do yeah. is being that they're just being right they're not doing any they're doing from a place of being um but then eventually they're taught well these kids because the changes that went on they kept this understanding of being valuable Right. So when they walk into a job, for example, it's like I want a certain amount of money because not only do I know I'm valuable, but because I'm valuable, you know, or because I have value, I'm valuable. The problem is they got to remember that they also have to be valued. <laughs> <laughs> like your environment needs to know your value. And it's not that you have to perform to do that. You get to be who you are. But if you don't know who you are, how is that person supposed to know who you are? In other words, see that you're valued. You know, and so it, your job is to define that. So these kids that are just like, I think it's great that they know they're valuable, but the problem is they have to know how they're valuable. Mm -hmm. And and that's what they don't know. So they're coming in demanding the other side know it. It's almost like those couples. It's like, but you didn't know. I can't read your mind. Right. <laughs> you know, like you never told me. Well, maybe we lived together for 25 years, but I still am not a mind reader. Um, it's your job to inform others of what that where that value is valuable you know where you can value me this is i'm going to show you exactly where you can value me um in this system they need to learn that they don't need to learn to jump through hoops like we did they don't need to learn that what they do is their identity and is their value right they, they've got it right and we can learn a lot from that but what we can teach them is that guess what you may not have to earn your value through what you do but you do need to define your value so that your environment can value you. Right. Right. And, and I think those are the conversations that, you know, I want to see more and more of, you know, in work environments in home environments and all of that is that, you know, the reverence piece is I already recognize you have value because if, if, if you didn't, you wouldn't be here. Right. So just from that premise alone, I, I understand your value. Um, those of you and I, we can see people's value. Right. So it's not a heart, a long stretch, but the reason we can see it is because we first believed it. We first trusted it. We first gave in to the principles of what we were raised with, you know, which is each person is valuable, you right. know, to some degree. And so if we can lead with that and then say, all right, however, there is this dynamic going on that we get to unpack, but we get to do it from a place of valuing from a human perspective. You know, this whole idea of like, okay, that triggered you, not it that's not my whatever that is that's not mine that's that person's whatever they're working through and i can i can be neutral to that without and being neutral also means i don't feel the pain of their projection but i also don't don't need to deal with it right <laughs> I, I don't I, I don't need to make it better right. you know i don't have to feel bad for it but i also don't need to make it better right that's on you and and to be able to speak to that kind of like we were saying about not being afraid of if i'm christian to be able to come from that platform. You know, if I believe in God, to be able to come from that platform and, and also at the same time do it in such a way that I'm reverently not offending other people, right? Um, that is what I feel is, is really what we're here to do. We're here to figure out how to be who we are as sovereign beings, whatever that means, and at the same time interact and be connected with the rest of the world. 
right? Um, it's not about trying to get, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats to like, you know, cross. To like each other. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's like, you know, actually you're supposed to be different and it's in the integration of what each side brings that is the solution. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I feel like where I've been, I've been really bumped down to levels of humility that, you know, are good, good for all, good for me, good for all of us, you know, been from people who have spoken truth, who have been clear and kind, you know, said, you know, this is the, I mean, for whatever it's worth, here's some feedback if you're open to it. And did it feel good at the time? It did not feel comfortable, but it did it, was it true? It felt true. Right. And I think when we're clear and kind, it will come across as a truth that the other person can't deny, mm. you know, and even if it's not their truth, they will know it's our truth and they can respect us. They can ex at least ex respect that truth as being ours. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. so good. There have been so many great little nuggets you've given today. And obviously the show is called Hope Revealed. And typically we dig into something like a dark moment in your life and we move into that. But however, in this uh, episode today, I think that we've exposed a lot of areas in life in general that can seem unclear, can seem dark, can seem like we don't have the, the obvious answer how to get to the other side of that thing. And you've shared quite a few examples there, but let's say that Bob's listening right now, right? Uh, or, or Sally, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they are in that position where they just started with you. They've been listening to this program so far. And like, that's great. Uh, how in the world do I, do I start working on that, Tracy? I don't, I don't live near you or anything like that. And I've got a busy life. I don't have time for, I mean, I just barely had enough time to listen to this podcast today. So, you know, what's some, what's some beginning steps for somebody like, like that? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, you know, I always believe that we, we don't have time. We make time and we make time for the things that are important. All okay? right. So if we go from the oxygen mask analogy, you know, if this is something that, that feeds you and nourishes you to be your best self, then you get to make time for it. Right. Um, and, and to that point, I always believe, you know, like in marriage, like in dating and then eventually marriage, you know, you have to be able to spend time and recognize I trust my gut and I trust other people's guts. And so you don't really know if that person's a good fit for you unless you have some time with them. Um, so I do give complimentary, you know, first sessions, I call it this discovery calls, right, where if I can and I'm really looking to bring my skill set to the table, I'm not looking to try to sign you know, everybody up who I speak to. I mean, if they choose to work with me, that's totally up to them. But I would say start with a complimentary call because at the very least, whatever you want to bring to that conversation, if I can bring my skill set and say, okay, this is what I hear. Maybe you want to look at it from this, you know, angle. Perhaps you want to reach out to this resource. You know, what if I can offer anything to that person? And even if they take it away and I never talk to them again, you know, it's something that helps them in that moment then that's what, that's what I'm here to do, right? So I'd say, you know, if, if you're curious, if this has resonated with you, if you want to start making time for the things that you really need to unpack for yourself to be the best person you can be, leader or otherwise, um, just reach out to me. I mean, you, people can get me through my website, uh, theinnatecoach.com. There's, uh, there's a contact Tracy um, section and, uh, you know, get started that way because, you know, that's what I'm here to do. It's like you, here to provide myself as a resource. I was given gifts and I don't believe that they're to be squandered. And so, you know, I would just say, reach out, like, you know, take the time. Yeah, no, that's so great. Thank you so much, Tracy. And of course, you know, this will be all edited and you would have just seen her website there popping up underneath her face <laughs> and she was telling them all about it. So yeah, one day I'll get to it and I'll edit all this stuff out. Uh, but anyway, it's been so, so, so great talking to you. And there were, boy, folks, y'all better hit rewind and go back. And, and if you didn't already take some notes, you need to. Um, this was really fantastic. And there were some great, great nuggets you offered to folks. And um, you. besides uh, coaching, you do uh, offer to like, you do some keynote stuff, right? You could go around and speak and do things of that nature. You're, you're not a half bad talker. So yeah, um, thank you. Well, I, can, you know, we could always, we can always work on it more, but yeah, I love to be, I love mostly because I love engagement. Um, I think that, you know, when we can bring ourselves, you know, and show up physically, you know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful experience to have, um, not only, you know, for others, but for ourselves, really, you know, for us to be able to be in with others. And so I love, I love to do, to key, do keynotes, but especially things where I can do interactive work. You know, there's that yeah. teacher in me that loves to, you know, interact with, with whoever it is I'm speaking to. So yeah, yeah I, I do all sorts of different talks. And they can find all that stuff on your website, I'm sure, right? They can. Yeah. It's, it's, it's under the event section. That's fantastic. 
Well, it's again, it's been so good. And I'm so excited we had a chance to do this uh, because I just wanted to be able to share you with the world and in my network and places where I can share you because I just think you have a voice that uh, most definitely needs to be heard. And, uh, and thank you so much for, for knowing who you are and, and living that out on a day-to-day -day basis all the way from the metropolis of Pittsburgh, North Carolina. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. I'm touched. And, you know, you know, right back at you. You know, what, we're here to help support one another and, you know, what you're doing and, and who you are and, and, you know, your ability to show up. I mean, I, I know the last couple of days, I mean, I don't know, no, but I mean, I, I, I knew you've been through quite a lot just in the last couple of days and to show up for today, you know, that is the measure of the man um, in so many ways. And so I thank you for who you are as well. Mm, thank you so much for that. It's so good. There you go, folks. As I always say, it doesn't matter if there's a dark moment, there's a place where it seems like you just don't know if things are going to work out. <laughs> there's always going to be a hope revealed. If you'd like to be a guest on Hope Revealed, feel free to reach out to us here, or you can visit us at mattcrump.tv, where there's always a hope revealed. <laughs>